in a real way, not in a just thought, oh, that would be nice, I could lead somebody to Jesus. No, what, what do we want our days to look like? You know, Jesus tells us to live for today. Yes. One day at a time. And I was just reminded of that at this funeral service that when we were there. It's just like, you don't have any guarantees that you get to talk to for somebody tomorrow. So, uh, I had an incident in my life when I first began walking that I was praying for one soul a day. Um, and I was seeing it. I'd get up and God would show me some place to go inside the mountain home where we were living. I would see a street sign or a park bench or a you know, and I knew the area, so I knew where it was at, and I would go there. And God would show me who the person was, and I would pray over him and lead him to the Lord. And it was go it's going on for like 15, 20 days. And, you know, I would pray over park benches. He would say, pray that the third person that sits in this bench is set free from fear. So I'd pray, and then I'd go sit on another park bench. <laughs> I would wait, you know, and the first person would sit down. Second person sits not on where I was at, but next to it. Next person comes, sits where I'm at, and I go, what happened, Lord? And he says, that's only two. Oh, that's right. I didn't sit in the middle. I sat here, yeah. Next person that comes out, and she's sitting down for lunch, worked in the courthouse. It was in front of the courthouse. She sets her lunch down on the deal, and she sits down, and she went, and she began bawling, and she just gathered up her stuff and left. You know, and you just go, you're crazy, Lord. Absolutely crazy. But I was... In the midst of that, God spoke to me early one morning. He says, I want you to go see Frank Church. And Frank Church was a senator in Idaho and had uh, just give up his seat. Uh, he had some health problems. And uh, he was back in Besheeta, Maryland. And uh, I didn't know that, but the first day when he, when he told me, go see Frank Church, I got up, you know, I'm, I'm off the floor, and I'm excited. Dana gets up, and I'm telling her. The first thing I did was get on the phone and call somebody that had lived in Idaho their whole life, and I said, who's Frank Church? <laughs> they tell me who he is and where he's at, and, you know, and I'm going, okay. You know. and he says, you should go to a bus stop or go to the bus station and find out what it would cost to get across the country. When I tell Dana, the first thing she says is, you should go to the bus depot and find out what it would cost to go there. I never listened to either one of them. Of course, you know, soulmate, helpmate. No, man, I'm not listening. <laughs> so every day for about the next 25, 30 days, I'm, what, part of my prayer was, thank you, Father, for Frank Church, you know, and I would call a radio station or somebody and find out whether Frank Church had came back to town, to Boise, where he lived. No, he's not back yet. Okay, you know, so because I listened to the enemy, instead of what my wife and this other young man that was a Christian friend of ours said, and the enemy says, when he comes to Idaho, go see him when he comes back to Idaho. He just added that phrase to what God said, and I grasped it. 30 days later, I'm laying on the floor. There's lots of room in, in the center. be better because of the whiteboard probably. The, and I'm, I'm laying on the floor, and I'm praying, and God says, I told you to go see Frank Church. I get up off the floor, and I'm going. I'm going to go to the bus depot and find out what it takes to get there, and so I, we don't have any money. So I walk downtown about a mile from where we were at to where the bus depot was. I walk down there, and the ticket place is closed. It doesn't open until 10. There's a restaurant across the street. So I go across the street to that restaurant, walk inside, and there's a newspaper face down on the table. And I had 35 cents. Coffee is 25 cents. I asked the lady, the waitress, I said, can I sit there and read that paper? i got to wait for the bus depot to open. Oh, sure, no problem. That's what it's for. Okay, so she gets me my coffee. And I sit down, and I turn that paper over. Frank Church dies at age 52. And everybody told me, oh, God sent somebody else. That's just a cop-out. There is no clue. There is no truth to that statement. Sooner or later, there's a last person. Was I the last one? I didn't go. I don't know whether God wanted to heal him, save him, what it was. I have no clue because I didn't go. So today, 
when I'm hearing them, you know, talk about you have no guarantee of tomorrow, all of this stuff came back to me. You know, and the song that we just sang is, is, is something that I, I tried to do all my life. I live for the audience of one. I, I, my goal is to know him. My goal is to see him face to face. Uh, you know, that's who I am. There isn't anything else. If I take somebody fishing, we're going to talk about Jesus. I don't care what we do. We're going to talk about Jesus. But I was reminded of what it means to hear God's voice and then go, nah, when he comes back here, that's what you meant. Because the enemy will always add on to what God says to twist the truth. Amen? So... Yesterday we talked about the elementary principles of God and we talked and we showed you all of the scriptures back down through clear to when Jesus is prophesied about in Isaiah 61. We didn't go to that one, but it says the same as Mark chapter, I mean Luke chapter 4, verse 18. So, and I said we need to be doers of that. Until we're doers of that, we cannot move further. God's not going to give us more until we're doers of the elementary principles. But by that doing, I don't mean you do it to get approval. You don't do it to achieve a height in God. You do it because of Christ, because of who you are. Not to get an appointment to be someone, but because you are appointed, because you are a called one, because you're a called out one. So we do those things because we love. The doing does not get you the favor of God. The doing is because you have the favor of God. We want to battle with the enemy when Jesus already won the battle. Amen? Amen? So we are, we are in a different spot. So I wanted to clarify that before we start tonight, that I'm not talking about doing these things to get to a place in God that you already have. It's walking from there because you love him. You're compelled to. Amen? Amen. Okay. So I got to finish out last night, so I get to start today. Um, and I'm going to do another horse analogy. Can you believe that? But before we do that, Remember we talked about, what was the, uh, the key thing that we are looking at? We, okay, and it is, yeah, you are here. And then, yep, Ephesians, Ephesians. Oh, Ephesians, I'm sorry, I'm sure. Four. Fifteen. And that is the uh, Amplified, the classic um, Amplified that has that on the Ephesians 4, 15. And, and looking back at that, remember on Ephesians 4, um, Ephesians 4 can keep you as humble as you ever really want to be because it gets you focused on really what is the first thing first and what is your goal for where you want to be. And again, I just want to, one of those image things, I just want you to re remember me talking about the love burrito, right? That all of those things, all of those power, all of the abilities, everything that they talk about are ours that we are to be trained up in and given release to and given direction to do. The only reason why it has any power, has any goodness to it, is because it's truly, right? Because it talks about truly, and then it being enfolded in love. And talked about how powerful that is because if our motivation comes from anything other than that it's generally pride the flesh the world uh, our own insecurities our own askew ideas of what 
Christianity really is, uh, was established. And uh, there's 141, and I'd love if you guys proved me wrong or right on this one, but I'm pretty sure 141 love one another's. Throughout the whole Bible, love one another. It is so important. And if it's repeated that many times, and it's in both, it's in the beginning and it's clear to the end, then you know that I, that is where we need to major. We need to major on the things that he talks about a lot. But <clears throat> my horse analogy is about really looking at our idea of success in Christianity. And um, all of you, uh, anybody who is a horse person at all knows we just had the Kentucky Derby and we had the Belmont and we had the Preakness, the Triple Crown. And this year, for those who don't know, it has been 50 years since Secretariat won the Triple Crown. His records have never been broken. He ran faster than any other horse ever. Yeah, and still, yeah, nobody has broken his records. It's just phenomenal about him. And there, you can talk to people in, in many different countries, and you can say the word secretariat, and they know who you're talking about. He is a very, very famous horse. And he is what we would call the goat, right? The greatest of all time. Secretariat is the goat. And, and so, and that was how he was advertised. And they made a big deal out of it this year because you know, any kind of anniversary, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna pump that as much as they can. And the the statues of Secretariat are on so many different tracks. And they actually buried him at one of the tracks, he's there. And so you're going, that is incredible because he was so fast. He was so amazing. He was just so awesome. And in reality, I'm here to tell you, he was a failure. He was a failure. Because they, when he got done with the Triple Crown, they, of course, go into syndication, and so you got different syndicates that put money into the, the horse because they know the breeding program is where the real money is. Uh, it goes on forever. And if they are, if he is successful with his first line of foals, whatever they are doing for stud fees, they can just start adding more and more. His first... A uh, batch of foals did nothing. They did nothing. And he started out, his breeding fee was $125,000 to breed your mare to him. Uh, and that was a guaranteed light foal. That means if the mare slipped the foal or if it was born dead, that you would get a rebreeding. Yeah, it, pretty good deal. But his first batch of foals did nothing. So they thought, okay, we'll wait for the next year. And the next year. And the next year. And it came down to, at the last, uh, his breeding fee was down to 65000 which is sometimes yearlings at the sale go for 65000 And he was, he died at a very early age for stallions, he was 19 years old when he died. And he died famous, but he was a failure because for what he could have, for the potential that he had. And I talked about, you know, what makes us great is our heart. Secretariats, when they did an autopsy on him, he had an extremely large heart and if they would have kept racing him there was a chance it would have exploded 
but but they and they didn't know that but they just they didn't want him to run anymore so at 19 he actually was he had a foot problem and they put him down now uh there's another horse by the name of Northern Dancer. You never heard of him, have you? No, you probably never will hear of Northern Dancer. Northern Dancer did run for the Triple Crown, and it was way back when Willie Shoemaker and, and uh, Hardtack were, uh, were jockeys at that time. So he was, he was way back, and his, his sire was... Um, was a, a, a really good horse also. So they ran him, he won the Derby, he won the uh, pre, uh, the Bel Belmont, uh, and then he just kind of ran out of gas and he couldn't win the Triple Crown. But he was an amazing horse. And he actually was kind of short. We remember the movie uh, uh, with Seabiscuit, you know, Seabiscuit was kind of a short horse. Okay, so Seabiscuit had some lineage back into Northern Dancer, so same lineage. So when he, uh, he started breeding, the, and of course this was several years before Secretariat, his first breeding fees was only $10,000. That was it, that was all. But of course, that was a lot of years ago. In 1985 to 1987, it was one million dollars. No guarantee live foal. He only stood to five mares a year so they could guarantee. But he was one of the first horses ever he won Horse of the Year in America, and he won Horse of the Year in Canada. Nobody knows about this horse. He had uh, 645 foals, named foals. 411 of them were winners. That means they paid for their food. You know, they got enough money to pay for the trainer and everything else at least. And of those, 147 were stakes winners. That means they made bucks. At 20 years old, at 20 years old, which is old for a horse, they, the syndicate that had him was offered $40 million from a European syndicate just to be able to finish out and have the breeding fees from him. Forty million dollars at 20 years old and combined over the 22 years of breeding and his foals that sold at Keeneland he made a hundred and sixty million dollars through because they were his foals a hundred and sixty million dollars in his career of breeding now, you don't know anything about Northern Dancer. Anybody who knows anything knows about Northern Dancer. And in Europe, and the Arabs, and Japan, and anybody who could get hold of a horse that had his lineage knew what they had. He was special. He was very special. But what he had was short legs. <laughs> he, he did not fit your idea of what an amazing champion should be. They even, his sire, they had to make ramps up so he could even get the job done because the mares were too, too short for him. I mean, yeah, he was too short for the mares. So, so it, and they, they can't do artificial with thoroughbreds. So, so here was this guy who fit nobody's criteria of what he should have been as a champion. He's totally unknown, and he changed the entire world of horse racing from being the tall, leggy horses to the horses that had grit. And they said that was the amazing thing about him, that his owner would never let the jockey use a stick on the horse, never put a whip to him, 
He said, if they've got the heart for it, they'll run that race. You don't have to beat them to do it. And that was with the lineage that he put into all of his foals. They were strong. They were well behaved. They were horses that um, uh, you, when the jockeys got on them, they knew they had a winner that they were sitting on. They would fight over who would get to, to ride his foals. What's the point? The point is we value the Shazam. We value like Secretariat. Wow, that is awesome. And I'm, I have, have nothing, nothing against Billy Graham. But Billy Graham was touted as one of the greatest evangelists of all times. How amazing he was. And all that he, all the cities that he, It's not you that they'll get mad at. It'll be me that they'll get mad at if I say the wrong thing. So, so, so he, he did all of that, and they would go back into cities years later to find out how much those campaigns, and those are two years. They put two years into a city before they would go into a pre, do everything that they could, do the whole program, get everything set up, and they would go in three years, or was it three years, five years? Three years later, and they would do their survey, 3%. 3% difference. That was it. That was it. And we're going, that was a great success. Um, and it is. It it it's not backwards. He wasn't going backwards, and and the and the city didn't go downhill. But we're looking at that of how many people uh, know of a gentleman that I can't even tell you his name because I can't remember. But we we just talked about it recently, and there was a funeral, and some of the greatest guys, evangelists, speakers, guys who have gone throughout the world and started people movements all over the world in places nobody else could go and nobody will ever know who they are. And they have done amazing things. Only those who really understand what missions is about and putting their life on the line. And these guys are at this funeral for this one fellow and they said, how'd you get saved? You know, what? Where, where, you know, what was it that, that got you so you wanted to go on a mission? And so one guy starts telling the other guy, I was going along the street, and there was this guy in a brown suit. And as, we were go as I was going by, he would just step out away from the shop, and he would say, and he's standing in the doorway of his shop, and he would say, young man, can I have a moment of your time? And he would lead them, not only to the Lord, but implant a seed inside of them that they became great missionaries. So he's telling this story to the other guy. The other guy went, no way. That happened to me too. The guy, the little guy, he's in the brown suit, yeah, yeah. Same brown suit, yeah. And he, that's how I got started. And so they're talking about it, and somebody's going by, and they're going, what are you talking about? Yeah, this guy, this guy, you know, we were talking about how he got saved. It was this little guy in his shop, you know, and, and he goes, no, that can't be true. No, really? And he stops and says, that's exactly what happened to me. Huh? We're remembering two different stories, so, but, but it's okay. I'm going to tell my story. And, and 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 I'm pretty sure I'm okay, but if, if I'm wrong, I will repent. All right. Well, I can repent. I have nothing else. You know, it's it's an admirable thing for you to think about. This is a man who stood in his shop door in his old brown suit and pulled in people. Jesus pointed out to him, and and Jesus would say. That's one right there. And so he would go out and believing that what Jesus had told him was true, 
Young man, can I have a moment of your time? Can I speak to you? And every one of those guys were out putting their life on the line for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you will never know his name. You'll never know his name. But the people that he brought to the Lord changed missions and changed the spread of the gospel throughout the world. So when we start looking at this, and last night I asked you to say, you know, take a moment to think about you are here. Where are you? What are you, what are you accomplishing? Are you where you want to be? And is that a goal that you would like to go to? Remember that there, if you're looking for the glitz, you're looking for the glory, you're looking for notoriety, you're looking for anybody to even know your name, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And you can walk in more power than you've ever walked in before, and you're doing it for who? That's right. That's where it is. That's the glory. And you want the more? You want the maturity? You want to walk in full maturity? You want that? That's what it takes. Just a little death. Just, just a little death. And dying to yourself. And giving yourself completely over to what it is you think you really want. Which is to walk a naturally supernatural life through listening to the one who's in charge. Remember the other horse analogy, trusting the one who's in charge and believing him and trusting him and full faith in him. And you can go over the most huge jumps and be um, someone in the kingdom of God that changes the world. Okay? All right. That was my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so, 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 the the reality of life in Christ we have learned through tradition traditions that. Our, our Sunday meetings are Christianity. They are not Christianity. They're a Sunday meeting and a gathering in which we can edify each other and incredible to be around each other, the gathering of the saints. We're told not to forsake that because even more so as the day approaches, we need to assemble the God together because of the darkness and because we are the light. So when... For Dana and I, it's always been about the guy that is the unknown. And many of the places that we go, there is no way that you want your name known. Because if you do, then they're going to be following you everywhere you go, and all those you meet are in danger of getting persecuted. So the idea is to stay invisible, not to be seen, not to, not to have your name in lights. Unfortunately, sometimes that doesn't work out well, and you still get people persecuted. And, uh, or deported. Pardon? Or deported. Or deported. <laughs> the guy getting deported wasn't bad. It's what hap has happened since to my friends and to those that are a part of that movement in India. So um, let's take a minute and pray. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm conflicted in how... I want to go forward, so I would prefer that we just stopped and prayed for a minute. So anybody that feels led to pray, please.
Oh, I, I didn't come to the Lord through the church. I didn't come to the Lord through the Bible. I came to the Lord through a personal encounter with Jesus following some sheep. And then five years later, six years later, having a broken neck and being a paralytic in a hospital. And Jesus came into the hospital room and healed me. I hadn't been in church. I didn't know anything about Christianity. I just knew who encountered me. He was looking for me. I was not looking for him. I was not trying to become a Christian because anything I knew about Christianity was, it was worse than the hypocrites and the bars to me. That's because I was in the bars. <laughs> no, I was a little younger to be in the bars. But the, the, the reality of my relationship with Christ caused me to always be at friction with people who had a legalistic view of relationship. And it, and it cost me a lot. But when I sit and think about the scriptures, because they're my life, uh, I wouldn't exist in a sense without that book being my guide to the relationship. You know, uh, early on I found the scripture where it says uh, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but they're a testimony of me. So as I began looking at that, it, it kept driving me deeper and deeper into the relationship with Christ. So all some questions that came up early in my life from the Lord was, how did Abraham know it was me? He's a challenging. He's living in this land, and this voice comes and says, leave your father and mother and your family and follow me. Are you kidding me? That's a Eastern mindset is, no, family is everything. It's everything. So this voice tells him, leave your family. I have a country I want you to go to. I'm going to give it to you. How did he know it was God? How did he know it was any God? True child of the Lord. Pardon? True child of the Lord. True child of the Lord. We're all true children of the Lord, every one of us. But the, but the reality of knowing that voice is God's. We hear voices all the time. And yet, it was God. How did he know it was God? Because it was. We all know that voice. We all are aware of when that voice speaks, but we've been taught away from it. We've been taught away from the reality of the relationship. How did, how did David respond to the Lord? How does he know? You know? All through Scripture, we have the stories of people that responded to what? The voice of the Lord. Everything that's written in that book is somebody wrote it who was responding to the voice of the Lord. Amen? So let's move into the New Testament. 
the, the reality of most Christianity, it's in meetings. And we all hear God in meetings. We, we, we tend to have prophetic words in meetings. We tend to have healings in meetings. Because that's when we all come into one accord and in one heart. And, and these things happen. But the reality is, why aren't we doing it in our houses? If, if it's the Lord, why would it be one meeting, two meetings, and the rest of the week he wouldn't be present? I'm always struggling to get people to recognize God at work, where you work, while you work, when you're playing, when you're, whatever you're doing. God in everything, the song that I had at, at the first, it's, it's about Jesus, everything. So, you know, it, it, I tell people you need to dial Jeremiah 33.3 on your phone and then plug an earplug in and never hang up because that's the reality of Christ. Come and let's talk together and I'll show you great and mighty things you don't know. The reality is it doesn't say great and mighty things in, in meetings. It doesn't say great and mighty things if you pray right. It says, I'll, I'll show you. So remember after Jesus is resurrected and all these guys have ran away from him. You know, they all failed him in a, in a sense. I use that word in the book, but it, they left him. He, he leaves them. They wouldn't even pray with him in the garden. I mean, they slept. You know, and then when it comes time and he's getting taken, they're going, Psh, which is exactly what scripture said would happen. So Jesus is resurrected. The next time we, that we see the guys is they went fishing. They're fishermen. That's the way they made their living. That's who they were. These guys are families of fishermen. They own their own boats. So they know where the fish are in that sea. They know where to fish, what time to fish. They make their living at it. So here they are out fishing, and they fish all night. And what does scripture say? Nothing. Nothing. And then Jesus is on the shore, and he says, cast your net on the other side. And they think about it, and they throw their net on the other side, and they catch so many fish, they can't haul them in. They've got to just drag the net to shore and then take them out of the net. Did anybody get saved in that? Was there any healings in that? Did Jesus do any teaching? It was about their work. He prospered their work. He showed them how to catch fish when they, on their own means, these advanced fishermen, if I could call them that. They're, they're journeyman fishermen. Their families are fishermen. Their grandfathers were fishermen. And they're fishing, and they can't catch any fish. And the voice of the Lord into their profession caused them to have food and money. Hello? So why is it we exclude Jesus from our work? Why is it we all, if I ask, if I ask for a raising of hands, how many people in this room hear God's voice, how many hands are going to be raised? Huh. They didn't ask Jesus to be a part of their fishing trip. They knew what they were doing. They had the skills. They had the boat. But there was a difference. They had been changed. They no longer can walk by themselves. They can't do their job by themselves because they're going to fail because they made a commitment to who? Jesus. Yes, we'll follow you. You said you'd make us a fisher of men. He knew their hearts. He didn't call them because of their expertise in dealing with people, the sons of thunder, <laughs> Peter, Nathaniel, the lazy guy laying under the tree, the tax collector that everybody hates, the betrayer. He calls them from all kinds of walks that are not noted as being really respectful. 
fishermen are stinky guys, bad tempers, but they know what they're doing. And yet, because they've chosen to walk with Jesus, they can't do their job anymore without him. They hear his voice and obey his voice, and they find their provision. Hello? So then, where do, where do we spend most of our lives? How many hours a day do you work? Whether you're a housekeeper or a mom at home with kids, how many hours a day do you put in doing work? A lot. So then why wouldn't Jesus be there? I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's not that we don't know God's voice. It's that we've been told by the world and the enemy and everything else not to listen unless you're in a religious meeting. Separate your Christianity out from your life and live it at these points. I've seen stuff that people only dream of seeing. I've seen the dead raised. I've seen cancers off. I saw a leg grow out from a, from a polio leg to a full leg. No, no, this was in India a few years back. But the reality of these things is that those aren't what spur me on. What spurs me on is that Jesus trusts me. Jesus and I walk together. When he does those kind of miracles, I'm just so flabbergasted because it's never what I want. It's never at my timing. It's never the way I perceive it. I don't get famous from it because I won't. I'm not interested in that. But villages changed, people changed. And the very first thing that I teach new people when they want to walk with the Lord is, what's he saying to you? Anybody that comes to my house, they know that within five minutes I'm going to ask them, what's the Lord saying to you? Is that true, Pat? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I want them to know they're hearing from God. Oh, nothing. What do you mean, nothing? Are you a Christian? And how, why are you saying God's not talking to you? Why is, why is that a thing that we, we live with? So there's the three things that cause us not to be able to hear God's voice or believe that he's not talking to us. They're called identity, perspective, and position. Did you notice that? Just that's a pretty strong finger. <laughs> We're always uh, teasing each other about the way we communicate with each other. You know, she can just be looking at the salt shaker, and I'll reach out and grab it, hand it to her. You know, because there's an intimacy. There's a there's a reality. Even when we disagree, there's a reality that we walk in intimacy together. It isn't that we have to agree to the everything. It's that we choose to walk in intimacy with each other. We choose every year to have a better friendship. Position. Huh? Position. 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 Okay. Identity. Yes, probably. Our identity of God sometimes is so far from reality. And we see him in a way that he does not reveal himself in the Bible. We see him as hard. We see him as distant. Uh, sometimes because we don't think we're hearing from him. We don't think he answers prayer. You know, I'm not worthy. So our, our view of God, our identity of him actually can limit what he can tell us because he knows how we're going to receive it because of what we think of him. Our identity, the identity that we have of ourselves affects what we hear. Identity affects what we hear and how we hear. If you don't believe that's true, go into a place and say you're a uh, 
say you're a foreman of a large crew and you work for a big company and they're having a gathering and you go there and you're wandering around the room introducing yourself to people that you've never seen before and one guy introduces himself and says, I'm the janitor. I'm the head of the janitorial staff. Oh, okay. And we walk over and we introduce ourselves to somebody else and he's the vice president of the company. How do we treat them? Do we treat them the same? No. No, no. We treat them in the way we see them. This guy, this janitor, doesn't give, have anything to give me. But the vice president, he could give me a raise. So we may treat them in the sense of our conversations being similar, but we, in here, are what we identify ourselves as and the position we see ourselves as and we, the position we see them in affects how and what we hear from them, whether we're interested in what they say. So your identity affects your relationships and it affects your relationship with the Lord. How you see yourself with him will affect what you hear from him. And therefore, since he knows everything, it'll affect what he can tell you. There are things when my son is five years old and he says, Dad, what's, what's that? You're not old enough. You know, well, later. Well, you don't need to see that. You don't need to know that. Because he's five. And I'm a father, and I recognize that there are things he doesn't need to know at five. He doesn't need to know how to sharpen a knife. He doesn't need to know uh, how to turn the stove on and cook. Okay, he's not ready for that. He, he's too short, whatever. So, but the identity of ourself the way we really look at ourselves shows by the way we walk, what we talk, how we treat others, how we listen to others. My identity in Christ affects how I interact with other people, or it should. If I'm identifying with Christ the way we, in the identity that he sees us with, it's going to affect how I listen to every person and how I value every person. But most times our self-evaluations and our evaluations of others because of the tone of their voice, because of the pitch of their voice, because of the way they walk, because of what shirt they wear, it affects how we listen to them. Does that make sense? If we're going to be the church of the living God and we're going to be this naturally supernatural people, that we're called to be, that Jesus paid such a high price for, there's two identities we need to get figured out. Who is God? And who are we in him? Amen. Not if I have to tell myself every morning, I'm son of God, I'm a son of God, I'm, I'm elevated to seated with him, I, I have, and I have to do this mantra over and over again, I have no clue who I am. I'm trying to convince myself. I'm trying to Puff myself up. It's like faith. The faith movement was great. It awakened a lot of things, but it elevated faith to a level that it never should have been. Because Jesus says, I gave every one of you the measure of faith. Every person has a measure of faith. And he said, that should be enough. Faith works by love, Galatians 5, 6. That word love there is the agape word, God's love, which we have a very narrow definition of. And it all has to do with abundance for us. Agape is God's character. The definition of agape is every bit of his character. All of it. Some of them we don't even want to discuss because he's judgment. He's jealous. He has anger issues at times from what it says. So we don't want that to be seen as a part of love. We don't go there. But his character is agape. He says, I am love. So all those characteristics fit there. That's where the fear of the Lord comes in. But in a reality, because of our identity with God and what we will accept and what we don't accept of him, 
what we don't want to talk about, what we do want to talk about, we end up giving a view to others of God that leads them to a place of frustration because we haven't presented the truth enfolded in his presence. Amen? Amen. Thoughts? Questions? Your identity affects your perspective. How you see yourself and how you see God affects the way you look at the rest of the world. I can even see some bald spots from up here, you know. <laughs> it, it affects us. Where we're at in our position, where we're at in the position we're going to walk out is affected by our identity and our perspective. Why don't we see God at work? Why don't we expect to have a conversation with him while we're having a conversation with our boss at the same time? We can do two things at once because most of my life I spent thinking about Dana and doing a job, so I know I can do two things at once. And it's the same way with the Lord. There is no place, no time that I can't hear his voice if I, if I recognize his voice. How does God speak? Make him answer. Make him answer. Absolute. Pardon? In, in, absolute. in absolutes. Well, that's okay. That's that's a part. Yeah. How does God speak? Myriad of ways. Quiet. Pardon? Myriad of ways. Myriad of ways. Quietly. Quietly. How does God speak? Through his word. How does God speak? Come on. In our thoughts. In our thoughts. In dreams. Dreams. Visions, hearts. Are you talking to me? <laughs> A donkey. Through other people. You know, how do we expect God to sound? We expect him to speak in sentences. We expect him to speak with words we understand. So we have this idea that when God speaks, I'm going to understand it as it unfolds. I went, yeah, I went to a lot of school to get that. <laughs> God's voice is. It's like a nanosecond. Just a less time than it took me to put that dot. God can give you a whole book to write. Right. Mm -hmm. And it takes you your whole life to put down on paper what he gave you in a nanosecond. God's voice just is. And most of us are waiting for him to speak in such a way that we understand rather than hear. Just the sound of a pin dropping, a chirp of a bird, can mean a whole paragraph to us. We're walking down the street and we're depressed, and all of a sudden this bird that we haven't heard since we were young kids when there was no cares is talking to you right next to you. And all of a sudden you know oh, it's going to be okay. Just a bird chirp. It's going to be good. I'm okay. How does God speak? What if we learn to listen? What if we learned his language? What if we stopped trying to tell him how to speak to us? Does God try and mock us? What? Does God out to fool us? Does he want us to fail? Then why is it that we don't listen to him more? Why is it we don't hear what he's saying? We're too busy doing what? Listening to, Listening to other stuff. Hmm. Yeah, when I was uh, teaching in 
India a few years back, and there was a guy has this huge network. And uh, every year he would have me come and teach his main leaders, and there would be like three, four hundred of them, of his main leaders, regional leaders, area leaders, and he'd always want me to come and and show them God's voice. And uh, so so I get up and, and uh, the leader himself says something and I just turned and looked at him and says, that's not right. You know, that's not the truth. And then I spoke something and, and uh, he went, yeah, you're right, Neil. And then somebody said something and I'm speaking to him and there's this woman in the back and she, it's like, this room is full, you know, and I see that I can just, it's like, you know, sometimes God just puts like a microscope on your, or a telescope on your eye and you only can see one person. And so I finally got them to have this woman stand up, figured out which one I was pointing to, you know, like, oh, so she stands up and I tell her, I says, what are you doing? I said, what are you doing? You are supposed to be planting house churches. You are a leader, and you're not doing anything. You're just going along with life. So they're translating this into her language. So she's, I, I don't pray over her. I just give her this word, and she sits back down. So one of the main leaders in this group stands up, and he says, I have a question for you, Neil. He says, how do you get such an anointing? And he was asking the question that every leader in traditional church asked me all my life. How many hours a day do you spend praying? What's your devotional time in the morning look like? How many hours do you, do you read the word? You know, how much time do you devote to his hunger? Anybody been there? Anybody been the one asking those questions? So that morning, I would got up at 5 a.m., and we weren't starting until 9, and I dug a mystery book out of my carry-on, and I spent the whole morning reading a mystery book. That was my preparations for the meeting. I'm reading a mystery book, just relaxing, just absolutely. And this guy is asking me, how much time do you spend to get this anointing? I know what he's asking for. He wants to know how early he's going to have to get up in the morning, and if, is he going to have to spend three hours in prayer and then an hour in devotional and then another hour in supplication? Or, you know, how, how can he get this anointing? How much work is it going to take to get this anointing? And, and everybody's looking at that, and they all go, oh, well, you know, how was your time in the morning? Oh, well, you know, I didn't get up and have a ten, ten, ten minutes with the Lord today. Didn't have time. And here I am sitting reading a mystery book that I just wanted to finish. <laughs> and uh, I says, oh, Lord, what am I going to tell him? What do I tell this guy? Because he's asking a serious question. And, uh, and I know what he's asking, but i got to tell him the truth. So what am I going to tell him? And he said, you, spend tw you tell him you spend 24-7 listening to me. And it shocked me for him to say that. You know, it isn't about our duty. It's about our relationship. I don't care whether I'm watching TV, reading a book, or what. I'm never trying to avoid Jesus. He's going to talk to me through whatever I'm doing, whether it's baiting a hook, whether it's fixing somebody's car. I don't care. I'm never out of contact with him. So how much time do I spend in preparation every day? Same amount. I get up, good morning, Jesus. Thank you for allowing me to walk. Thank you for the breath. And then I go. Sometimes I get to sit. Sometimes I don't. So it's not about dutiful time. It's about recognizing all time. I live and breathe 
I can't exist. I can't do my work. I can't, I, I can't. I used to tell people, you know, I could fix anything. And then after I really started walking with Jesus, I realized I couldn't fix anything. But he could. You know, I, I worked for this guy. I went to work for him. I don't know. What, I think this story's in the book, one of the books. But I, I go to work for him, and, and he, is, he's a, he owns Micron Incorporated So in Boise, huge computer chip place. I worked for him when he was starting that. And uh, so he gets to all of his millionaire business owners together every week for a luncheon. And he invited me to come and pick something up intentionally at one of those luncheons. So he sits there, and I come through the door, and he's got his hand on me, and he's going, this guy can fix anything. I tell you, you should read his resume. He can, he can do anything. Whatever you want done, he can do it. And I'm sitting there, and I'm going, God, you are setting me up. I can hear it coming. And he says, if any of you have trouble in any of your manufacturing plants and they can't get it fixed, call me. I'll send Neil if he's in town. Yeah. A week later, I get a phone call from Alan. Neil, you need to go to Simplot. What? You need to go over there. They're waiting for you at the manufacturing plant. Well, what am I going to do there? You're going to fix whatever their problem is. Jeez. So I start praying. Oh, Jesus, this is going to be nasty. I know if I was there and I was one of the people that built that place and I was the guy that wrote the schematics and I'm the electrician that put it all in, I'd be mad for him, the boss to call in somebody from outside. So... I get there, sure enough, the owner is there, and he's telling his manager, the, the engineer, the head of maintenance, and the maintenance personnel, whatever Neil says to do, you do it, because this line has been down for three hours, and it's costing me a lot of money, and you couldn't fix it, so you're going to do whatever Neil says. <laughs> and I'm looking at the daggers coming from their eyes. <laughs> Are you kidding me? When I walked in the building, on the wall in front of me was a blank plate on a box, an electrical box. And I just kept looking at it. And these guys are just mad. As soon as the boss tells them this, then he leaves. And, and I just keep, I'm, I, you know, it's like we're standing here, and I just keep glancing at that box. They go, hey, dummy, the machine is over here, you know. And they just start calling me all kinds of names, and they're really thrilled by my presence. <laughs> So I send the engineer to get some blueprints. And I send the head of the maintenance guy. I says, I need some tools. I says, and a meter. We're going to find out what's wrong with this line of equipment. And uh, I don't know what I told the other guy. I, but I sent them all away. And in, in my pocket, I always carried a four-way screwdriver and a pair of pliers. They didn't know that. So, so as soon as they get out of sight, I go to that box. And I open it up. And inside is all of these wires. It's just a junction box. But there's one set of them that are burnt. And so I reach in and get a hold of them, and I turn the wire nut and tighten it up. I get in the box back, and I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm going to get this on before they get back. Wrong answer. <laughs> I'm putting the last screw in it, and they show up. And they are derating me. I mean, they have went over the top, construction talk, bad trucker talk, you know, all of it. And so I said, okay, so you guys are mad. Okay, I, I understand. So let's get on with business here. I said, so why don't you show me how this thing operates? Take me through the process of turning this whole line of equipment on. So they walk over and they start going through it. I said, I need to know where the, where the sequence stops. What, you know, where to, I need to pinpoint the problem. They keep going and it runs. I've been there five minutes, which is what the boss told all of these <laughs> business owners. Neil can fix anything you have breakdown in five minutes. Thanks, thanks, I really needed that. And so they're standing there, and they're going, what did you do? And I said, well, unfortunately, you guys had forgotten that this equipment originally was over there. And I said, after I saw that box and you guys left, I saw this concrete 
cut line where you had buried the conduit from that box to this. And it's not in your as-built mechanical drawings, but when I walked in here, God said it's there. That's where the problem is. Since you guys decided to tell me what a bad guy I am, I sent you on errands. But I said there was a loose wire nut in there. And I said if you go over there, you can still see the two wires where they're burnt. But I said they're connected back together like they're supposed to be. One of the guys stayed and wanted to know how could I hear from God. What, how, how did you know it was, what, what do you mean God told you, God showed you? The other ones cursed me all the way out of the room. <laughs> I got to talk to that guy for probably 10, 15 minutes, told him about a relationship with the Lord, told him, you know, that uh, I can't work without him and I can't do my job without him and he's always doing this kind of stuff with me. Amen. And left. But that's, that's a normal place of life for me. I expected God to do the impossible. I expected him to show me the impossible. I had one company that I worked for that ended up firing me because the shifts I was on, whichever one it was, made more money than the other two shifts in this place. And I was the foreman of the um, mechanical guys, uh, Gee, they just forgot the name they call them. Millwrights. Millwrights. Thank you. <laughs> and so I would work different shifts. And the owners of the business were mad at the manager of this business because there was one shift that would always make more money than the other two shifts. And it changed. It would, you know, there's four shifts, actually, uh, working shifts, A, B, C, and D, but to have days off. They, so there's three shifts that work the 24 hour, eight hours each. I would come in at different shifts to, to work with different millwrights. So whatever week I would choose to work, you know, like this week I'll work swing, you know, next week I'll work days. Whichever shift that I was on that week, they produced 10% or more prop of product. And they could never figure out because it would be different shifts. So since it was different shifts, the owners thought that this manager should get all the shifts to doing the same. Otherwise, he could find a new job. So I take some days off to go do some ministry over on the coast, and I come back one day late, and I'm coming back onto a different shift. So as he's going through the papers for the week, he notices that four days, this shift produces 10% more. One day it doesn't. And so he looks up, and who wasn't there? And it was me. I wasn't doing anything special. But God was. So whatever shift I worked, when I was on site, they made more money. And he says, I've got to fire you. He says, because I can't, I know that it's because you're a man of God. And he says, you affect this place just by your presence. He's talking, you know, he's just like, he's incredulous. You know, and he's a Christian. But he's incredulous. How can your presence change the whole shift? He says, so I can't bring the other ones up because I says, I'll never get them all to know Jesus. And I say, he says, even if they get to know him, they aren't going to walk like you. So I have no choice but to fire you. Really? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> cool. And he fired me. So all of his shifts were the same. They still fired him a couple months later. So why am I telling you these stories? Because it I, I know who I am. I don't know all that I am, but I know who I am. I decided when all the people in my life told me, no, you can't do that. No, God doesn't do that anymore. No, that's not correct. No, God's not worried about what color shirt you wear. No, no, God doesn't. He doesn't worry about that stuff. They drove me to Jesus. They drove me to him, and I found out by being driven to him that he was much more involved in my life than what I gave him credit for. And all of a sudden, I figured out that the word said, my sheep know my voice. Does it say that? Yeah. The voice of another they won't follow. Why? 
They don't know it. That word know is the same word for the relationship between a husband and a wife. It's intimate. It's, I'm not talking the sexual part of it. I'm talking about the breath to breath, the eye to eye, the, the relationship that is closer than a brother. That's what he's saying. My sheep know. They are so intimate with my voice. They know me, and I know them, and they follow me. But the voice of another they will not follow because there is no relationship in it. So I began discerning. That was the first, okay, I have a mark, and I know one way to avoid to know the devil's voice from God's because there's no relationship in it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Okay. If it comes from outside, because where does Jesus live? In my heart. So where is he going to speak from? From our heart. So I just kept progressing with this until I figured out that everything in that whole word was about intimacy. And the boys fishing is not the first time he interviewed, he came into people's lives and helped them live their lives. It's a book filled with him talking with people and the results of it that they wrote. So here we are at the end of the age and we have trouble hearing God for work. We have trouble hearing it for our kids. We have trouble hearing it for our neighbors because we still have been taught by the world to fear hearing the voice of God. And our imagination, oh, cast down your imagination. We stopped there, but you forgot. It says, cast down your imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Anything that tells me that I can't hear God's voice needs to be busted up and thrown away. Anything that would say my relationship with God is less than Dan's or more than somebody else's should be thrown away. Nothing that Dan does or I do shouldn't you do. The problem is, is getting over the fear and the selfishness. We still want things to happen so that we have an emotional high. There was no emotional high when I'm fixing that piece of machinery. There was no emotional high. I tell people a lot of times, they go, what's it feel like to do that? And I said, a cold water pipe. I'm serious. I never got any feelings from it. I would be jealous because all the people around me are falling out in the spirit and they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'm going, how come I don't get to partake in that? He says, you want my word or you want that? I said, I want them both. And he's, <laughs> and he's given them to me at times. But what am I really about? Who is important? Not the people. Jesus. I live for Jesus, and he makes people important. He's the one that cares for them. I can't fix them. I can't care for them. I can't do it. <laughs> Whole conversation. I heard God, and I heard Dana. <laughs> I know that inside your hearts, you all know what I'm saying is true. There's so much in Scripture about it. Jesus never did anything unless the Father told him. He was walking as a man. He had to walk as a man because man had to pay the price for his sin. And God promised to provide the lamb. So he had to make a second Adam a second perfect man who would be willing to pay the price for us to walk with the Father. He completed the Old Testament. He completed the covenant of faith through Abram. He completed both requirements in one sacrifice and brought us into this place where nobody can break it. Nobody can take it away from us. And yet we have no clue how to just get up in the morning and hear for Father's voice. I hear so many people say, I'm trying, Neil. That's the problem. Once you start trying to hear, the enemy knows exactly what you're doing, and he just starts throwing truth at you at an appropriate time to lead you in the wrong direction or to the wrong conclusion. Deception is not a lie. Deception is the truth that leads you in the wrong direction. 
or to the wrong thought. Amen? If it wasn't the truth, it wouldn't be deceiving. He twists it. He adds to it. Did God indeed say? Well, yeah, God had indeed said. But he didn't, he didn't tell her a lie. He asked her a question at a right time. She was hungry. And she was walking in the same way as Jesus was walking. She knew by looking at the fruit that it was good for knowledge. She looks at it. She goes, oh, that's good for knowledge. That's good for wisdom. She's walking in the Holy Ghost. She's a complete person. She hasn't sinned yet. We've been redeemed. We've been redeemed. I am seated with Christ in the heavenly places. I've been given great and precious promises whereby I am a partaker of the divine nature. Most of you don't believe that in your heart. You assent to it, but you haven't found a place where you actually made it yours. That's where the kingdom of heaven suffers violent and the violent take it. God doesn't have, he, he knows us, but he needs us to know us. Does it cost? Absolutely. It'll cost you your grief, your sorrow, your pain, your anger, your bitterness, your unforgiveness. Anything I'm missing? Oh, self, pride. Pardon? Perspective. You're going to have to give up your perspective and get God's. Because then you see everything different. Then you recognize when the voice goes, oh, I can't hear that. I'm not good at that. You go, shut up. And you know it has to stop talking because it's a spirit. Shut up. No. When you yell, you just prove to the devil you don't know what you're doing. You don't know who you are. Because if you're really in authority... Yelling does nothing but show your insecurities. Does nothing. I can speak to a spirit in India from right here. I don't have to yell. I don't have to scream. I just need to know God's telling me to speak. The boys caught their fish by listening. Not by demanding. Well, you promised to give me the desires of my heart, and you promised to do this, and so I am speaking fish. You get in those nets. All night long, they're exercising their charismatic authority. And then Jesus speaks. Everything in the New Testament, you just go back and look at it. Every one of them were following a voice. They heard the voice. They responded to it. Everything. Amen? Amen? So let's test this theory out, shall we? Is it a theory? <laughs> so I'll, I'm going to, I want a couple of people to pray over somebody, and I'm going to ask you questions as you pray over somebody. Because I want you to recognize how much tradition you do that has nothing to do with what God speaks. So, one example. One of our board members of originally when we started Father's Hand, they were at a training and we were going through intimacy and discipleship and what we were teaching overseas. And it was probably the first time that we had taken our board through it. So it's in like early 2000s. And so the one guy's wife, the one of our board member's wife, had went out to water her lawn and she had sprayed a hornet's nest in the ground and they just swarmed her and she got like stung 22 times. It just so happened that her brother-in-law, who is allergic to a lot of foods and stuff, drives up and he has an EpiPen with him and he finds her laying on the ground almost passed out 
from all these bites, she's going to die. He gives her the one EpiPen, gets her in her truck, takes her to the hospital, saves her life. But she is in her house. We're having this training, and she is to be a part of it, and she is in her house, and she's not coming outside because she is, the fear has overwhelmed her. She almost died. So she is not coming out of the house. So after the first day, I send her and another couple back to his house, and I say, you're going to go home, and you're going to pray for your wife but you are not going to pray what you think she needs. You're going to pray what you hear, not what you think you need to say, not your interpretation of what God says. You're going to speak to her what you hear. So they get there, and the three of them gather around her, and her husband, in his, he says, okay, dear, I know that you need peace, but we're going to... We're just going to ask God. We're just going to stand here, and he's going to speak to us or show us, and we're going to pray for you from there. Neil just went through this with us. So he sees in his mind's eye or vision or whatever you want to call it, the movie, two purple bunnies bouncing towards his wife. Purple bunnies. And he's going, what? Just doesn't make sense. I, you know, okay, Lord, I'm going to do what Neil suggested. The first word, the first thing, it has to be God because we ask God, and He's not going to let the devil speak first. So he says, "Honey," he says, "I see these two purple bunnies bouncing towards you," and she just goes, "Oh, He's bringing me peace." <laughs> and they're just standing there looking at her, you know, like what? The next day, she comes to the training. She, she's free. No more fear. Because those two purple bunnies bought her peace. Her aunt, when she would stay with her aunt, used to have this storybook, and she would tell it to the kids at night, and it was about these two purple bunnies. <laughs> and they would always bring some of God's attributes or something whenever whatever the kids needed. She would make a story into that, and when they would go to sleep, she would tell them, the two purple bunnies bring you peace. <laughs> Nobody knew that. That's how personal God is. He's very personal. Gary wanted to quote four or five scriptures. He's all about healing. He has all the scriptures in his head. We have been taught to speak all these scriptures, and we'll just flood this person with all of these words from the Lord. But we are afraid to share what we see, what we hear. Jesus' prayers over people was short. His words over people were short. His time with the Father, everybody says, was long. I don't know whether it was or not, but God's pretty concise in his words. Another time, somebody saw a little red rubber ball in this person's life, them holding it. They had no idea that he had a book that he taught his kids faith through that was about this little raccoon, raccoon in the forest who was following this Jesus figure and as the only thing he could keep and take with him was this little red rubber ball, which was his faith. And as long as he had that red rubber ball, he had faith. But when he would lose it, he would be in fear. So he had taught nine kids and over 20 grandkids this same story out of this book so they would understand what it means to have faith and be in freedom from fear. So he came back from the mission field. He thinks he's done. He has no more, nothing else to do. He just wants to die. No value. He lost his faith. He's sitting in the room, and I know the story. I know that he's feeling this way. None of these other people even know who he is. So I had him praying for him, and this young kid sees him holding this red rubber ball. And he says, that can't be God. You know, He won't tell us what it is. So we... I asked the rest of the kids to pray over him, and they all heard some really cool stuff, but I knew that the key was with this kid. So I says, okay, since you told me you didn't hear anything now, would you like to tell us what you did hear? He says, well, I got a picture, he says, but he says, it can't be God. It just can't be God. It just makes no sense. And I says, what was it? I see him holding a red rubber ball. <laughs> he and the wife both broke, sat there and wept. 
and then I got to tell a story, and he says, I still have something to do. My faith has been restored. I am not dead yet. Amen. Just by seeing a red rubber ball. So when you come up here to pray over someone, I'm probably going to stop you when you start quoting scriptures, when you go, oh, Lord, I'm going to stop you. That's all religious rhetoric. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's good. But we need God. We need to go back to the presence of God, to the simplicity of those five, six basic things that you don't do, you are. You are those things. So then you got to learn how to hear and shut up and only speak what he speaks. John chapter 12, verse 49 and 50. Somebody read it. You can put it up there. I didn't finish. God, God took me in a different spot. So. 49 and 50. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak I speak just as the Father has told me. So I'm going to read that in the Amplified. This is because I have never spoken on my own authority or of my own accord or as self-appointed. And we charismatics have been taught to be self-appointed. We're going to speak, and God's going to honor what I speak. For, but the Father who sent me, he has given me orders concerning what to say and what to tell. And I know that his commandment, what he says, it means eternal life or is going to bring eternal life, the miraculous. So whatever I speak I am saying exactly what my father has told me say and in accordance with his instructions. No bragging, just fact. I've seen what you're looking for. And it only came when I started humbling myself to this statement. When I stopped telling God what he had to do and began to shut up until I heard from him. And if he doesn't give me anything to say, then maybe I'm just supposed to put my hand on him because laying hands on the sick will heal him. Maybe he doesn't want me to get any glory. Maybe he doesn't want me to think I'm great. I only speak what the Father says. I only speak exactly what the Father says. You know what I like to do after I even do that? I want to add some scripture so people will know it's sound. You know? I want to add a scripture to verify or to help them really understand what God is saying. Are you kidding? That person that needed to hear that his faith was still intact, there were still things for him to do, all he needed to hear was, I see you holding a red rubber ball. My brother's wife who was scared to death to go out because of the hornets only needed one word. I see these two bunnies, purple bunnies, running towards you. Set free. They could have prayed peace over her, could have prayed faith over him, and it would have been nothing because you could speak that to a thousand people. But a red rubber ball and two purple bunnies? It's not for you. Stop trying to interpret it. Stop walking by it and give them what God says. And watch what happens. The faith movement taught us some really good things, but they forgot the most important. What they got, they got by hearing. That's what they should have taught us. You need to get someplace and hear from God, and whatever he says, do it. Cho. All the people, when Cho started growing and his huge church just keeps growing and he has a prayer chapel that's got 10,000 people in it 24-7, and they would go to him. All the big leaders go to him. And he'd go, how'd you do it? And he'd look at him and say, I pray, 
and I obey. And they go, oh, you built a prayer chapel. Okay, we're going to go home and build a prayer chapel. We're going to start doing cell church. And he would tell them all over and over again. When they would ask him, how did you do it? And he'd say, I pray and I obey. They never did get it. They still wanted to build the cell churches, the 24-7 prayer houses, and figuring all that stuff's going to do it. And it hasn't worked anywhere but where he was at. Why? Because it's not God's word. So my wife, none of you really know her very well, so she's going to be the guinea, I mean, the person you're going to pray for. How fortuitous. How fortuitous. <laughs> so, I would like you to come up. Prophetic. <laughs> prophetic. I'm telling you, prophetic. I want you to come up. Yep. Come on. Come on. You are the same as anybody else. You can do it. I'm going to have four of you up here. Come on. Now, I'm going to stop you as you pray and ask you why you're praying it. Because what I want you to do is I want you to ask God, what do I pray for Dana? What do I say to Dana? And he's going to give you something. And for most, it's probably going to be foolish, and you're going to try and interpret it. It's okay. This is real, but I want people to, to learn from this experience. So I'm not putting you down. I'm asking questions because I want you to really look at what you're doing and why you're doing it. Amen? You can do it. The reason I called you up here is because of who you are. All right? You're a blessing. You're a man of God. You're a son of God, and you can hear his voice. Okay? Okay. So when you put your hands on her, maybe when you ask God, you're going to see a picture, a vision, have a thought, have an impression. How does God speak? Any way he wants. Is he going to speak in a way that they won't understand? No, he's not trying to mock them. He's not trying to do that. So, but it, yeah, it's probably not going to be in King James language because the language has changed some since then. Okay, so when you do this, it's going to seem weird because you're instantly going to go into the way we've been trained to pray in charismatic, which is good. There's nothing that it, we've seen a lot of healings through charismatic, but. If we're going to walk to the end of the days, we've got, to, we've got to be closer. So no matter where we're at, we have religious, traditional things that worked when the first guy did it, and then we picked it up and thought it should work forever. But it was what God spoke him to do or her to do. Amen? Okay. So I want you to come on up here and put your hands on Dana and ask the Lord, what are you going to tell her? Yeah, you guys are all going to put your hands on her. Yes. 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 I can handle it. <laughs> and then whichever one of you is bold enough, you can either ask me and say, I, I get this. Could this be God? Or you can just speak it out, and then we'll go from there. Yep. Don't all of you speak at once. <laughs> See, now this is something, uh, this is part of the training. We wait because we don't like what we hear or we don't think it could be God, and so we bypass it. But the moment I ask you guys to come up here, God gave you something. You're going to ignite it probably by asking him, and you're going to bring it back to your mind or he's going to bring it fresh to your mind. And then just speak it. You don't have to understand it. It's not for you. It's for Dana. Okay? Okay. Means anything else. Hallelujah. What's it mean, Dana? What was the word? Sea, sea of Galilee. Galilee. Sea of Galilee. And I have a friend that just went to the Holy Land twice in six months. Of course, I'm not saying I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I have any envious thoughts. No, of course not. Yeah. 
but that's the first thing that came to mind when he said Galilee. Because right. <laughs> I wanted, I, I'm thinking, man, I'd love to have my feet in there. And that is, that was. So there's no way you can know that. No. There is not a possible way. And it has nothing to do with what you thought might be a good word for Dana. No. Hallelujah. But it was God's word. Yeah. And in my mind, it seemed foolish, but I don't know. Exactly. And that's what the devil does. The moment God speaks, then the enemy has to twist it. He has to find a way to get you to add to it, to change words in it. He has to take away God's power. Amen. And the only way he can do that is get you to speak because he can't change God's word. You have to. God and man are the only creators, not the enemy. He has no creative ability. You didn't want to come up. No, I didn't. <laughs> and you were the first guy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Yes. That's okay. right. Man, Whoever. That's all I'm saying is garage. Garage? Yes. <laughs> Just came. Praise God. <laughs> um, uh, I, I just had a lady's brunch. And I thought I was going to be outside, and it wound up since being blistering hot for this deal, it was cold. And I wound up having to have it in the garage, in Neil's garage. And I kept saying, yeah, I can fix it up, but it's just like putting lipstick on a pig, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know this, is not, this is not looking that great, and yet... God, yeah, and by you saying that, and it, that was a direct word, he has called it a sanctuary. Right. He has called so it a sanctuary. So, you guys did really good. What happened? So, but the reality is when we're doing this with, with, this with other people that may not be Christian, you need to figure out how to pray it rather than just say it. So, Father, I just thank you that, that I, I see Dana, you know, in the Sea of Galilee. Or, Father, I thank you for this garage that is in Dana's life or whatever. But put it into a place that people can receive it or reject it where it's not something that they're forced to receive. So I, I tell people all the time, don't give words of God over people. Quit trying to be the prophet and be prophetic by just speaking in prayer over them or asking them a question. Does it make any sense to you that I see you and I, I see the picture of the Sea of Galilee? Ask them questions because it gives them a freedom not to go on the defensive out of fear. Well, I had no idea what that means. That's not a good picture. <laughs> so just okay. think about it. When you, those words are both incredible because neither one of you know what Dana's been doing mm -hmm or what's been going on and what we've been talking about, but they are, they are keys. And Dana knew what they meant, each one of them. Yep. And that will always be the case. What you're doing is not for you, it's for the person you're praying for. Amen? Okay. 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 I just, um, I just um, see this just giant flower, but it's like, multicolored it's like a sunflower but much more beautiful much more colorful and it just is giving off light so how would you pray that over her um i don't know uh, just in the same thing don't try and add to it or or anything I just, just I, I, thank you father uh, as i as i touch dana mm -hmm. whatever So you're, you're working way too hard at this. No, I just, I'm, I get overwhelmed with emotion when I see things. I'm just imagining that she, um, it's just how she sees the, the world. This, this is how you see the world. You, you see it through eyes that find beauty in every place. And when stuff is not necessarily beautiful, you see it as beautiful. Okay. You find it beautiful. That, that is incredible. 
But it, when you're gonna when you're gonna pray it over them, you want to just stick to exactly what you see in your prayer, and don't tell her what it should be, even though. But I loved it. But it <laughs> but it, uh, it, it awesome. you were you were right, yeah. but the idea is to let them find it. Mm. When you give it to them, then they can always hold you accountable for it, right. and they don't have to receive it. Right. They can, they can accept it while they're here, but they walk out the door and they still feel like the, everything in the world's ugly. Right. Okay? So if you just go, what you, what you said the first time, the only thing I would have added was, Father, I thank you that I see this when I put my hand on Dana. Mm. And then I would give them exactly what you showed us. Yeah. Originally, that's kind of where I was going. But yeah. Really, I just yeah. Think, and that, I just sometimes, the what I'm seeing, I... Yeah. get overwhelmed with the emotion of the Holy Spirit and I'm, I'm, I'm a crier when I, yeah. when the Holy Spirit is witnessing in me I just cry so it's yeah. sometimes I'm so and that's 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 a reality in us but we need to recognize we're speaking it to somebody still, still sorry <laughs> so, so when we're speaking to somebody else we want we want them to focus it and so we as the prophetic person that is praying over them we can. We can get it out, and that's why also why you need to keep it simple because yeah. then it doesn't overwhelm you. Yeah. yeah. So just by saying, Father, I just thank you that when I put my hand on Dana, this is what I see, yeah. and then then you can let go of it. Right. Yeah. Amen. And the and the other beauty is that Sea of Galilee, Huron. Nobody has to write that down for me. They don't have to write that <laughs> down for me. I'm going to remember that because it was a single word. And the beauty of what you just spoke, uh, the Lord has just, in the last three, four years especially, has just opened up my eyes to the colors, and I am doing watercolors, painting, creating, all kinds of beautiful things that I never did in my entire life. And God is just, he'll, he'll show me how to make something just sparkle and shine and and everything. So everything that you said no, was you can absolutely yourself on sea go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got one more. Okay. I should be using the mic is what you're telling me by turning this up loud. <laughs> no, he just wants to be able to hear you. Okay. I don't I'm see ready. any big spirit. But okay. I just have to say, Father, I thank you that Lord, you have given me three words and there are one area of encouragement. Lord, I don't know what this means. Okay, wait. Stop. This is not I'm not you you it's not that you're not hearing, but your wind up you don't have to wind up to it. You don't have to say, "Okay, I'm I'm doing this and I'm doing this." It, what is for them? Just give that part of it. I'm, I just Okay. The Lord has me give you one area In the area? She knows. Oh. Or he will give it to her. One of yes, two. that's true. We'll see. But, okay, but that's good. And this is, we get, I get this happening in every place that we teach this. Somebody will have a word like this, and then they, they start doubting or they don't give it. And the person doesn't understand it, and so then we go, okay. And they feel disappointed, and everybody else goes, well, why didn't they get a word? There is a word there. There's an encouragement. There, it's there. And most every time that that's happened, before the people leave, they'll know what it means. Okay. Okay. Let's anticipate. Okay. Yeah. Hallelujah. Great. Great God. So what did you get? What did you learn? Don't pray too much. <laughs> Don't say too much. Yeah. You can't pray too much. But prayer, prayer is listening. Believe in the cross as a balance symbol. Pardon? I got believe in the cross as a balance symbol. Okay. Falling into fear in Christ's death. Okay. Don't try to interpret. Yeah. 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 That's probably one of my hardest things when I'm praying for people is to... Uh, I walk in prophetic a lot, 
And so when you get into it, then you really want to stretch it out because you, you know, you can. And uh, I can remember all of those words without any assistance because they were simple, they spoke right to me, and they were exactly what I, I needed to hear. Even the one that I haven't got the full deal of encouragement, word of encouragement, I am so anticipating God dropping that on me. I'm, I'm just, it, that is so cool. But it doesn't have to be flowered up. It doesn't have to be um, profound in a way yeah. that we think profound is. We always are thinking prayer should be profound, and we always want to add to it with things that, because they come to our mind. You know, I see this flower of every color, and then there is these other thoughts that start showing up. They come after. And so when you go back to the first thing, you find that they know exactly, they will get it, and they will hear from it. Prophecy is never meant to be flattering. All the way through the Bible, every time you see the word flattery or flattering, God is again it. He, so a lot of the words we get for God, we from God, we will try and make them nice because we want the person to receive them. And by doing that, we actually go, we put all these words around God's word. He, had, he speaks simply. What was Jesus' prayer over Lazarus? Lazarus, come forth. That was his prayer. I thank you, Father, you always hear my prayer. Well, how can he know that he always hears his prayer? Because he only speaks what the Father tells him. So Lazarus come forth. He didn't have to explain it. He didn't have to go through, well, you know, God had me wait so you guys could see somebody raised from the dead. It's an important thing for you to learn some lessons here. No, he didn't have to explain that. He just said, Lazarus, come forth. Yes, Pat. I walk in a restaurant at home. I'm waiting always to hear from the Lord. And when he speaks something to me about someone, I'll find some way to walk up to him. And I'll probably ask him a question, which Pat knows I'm probably going to do that he set me up for this. So. But, the, but the reality is, is I had to move it out of church. Because actually, church is, is a place, it's not a place where we're supposed to preach the gospel. We're supposed to preach the gospel to the world. Preaching the gospel means to show and tell. Not just tell, show and tell. So then I need to be like Jesus. Oh, makes you really mean and proud sounding here, Neil. I don't care what it sounds like. That's what he sent us to do, was to be like Jesus. So then I need to be ready instant, in season and out of season. And when I see somebody, like in a crowd, many times, meetings or... In restaurants, I've embarrassed my wife many times. You know, but I will just see somebody, and I can't. I no matter who I'm talking to, I'll end up turning and looking at them, and I'm still talking to this person over here. Then I have to draw my attention back. Pretty soon, I'm, well, why wouldn't that be God? When you got up in the morning, you went, God, I want to do something with you today. I want, Father, I don't. I want to be used and needed today. So then why wouldn't your attraction to this one person out of 30 be God? But you, you still don't have a word from him because you haven't responded to the fact that it's God. Yeah. Holy Spirit, how's he going to talk to you? He, he causes you to, to see things. He causes you to hear something that draws your attention. Okay, so then I'm drawing my attention and I, and I finally consent that I'm going to go to this person when I, by the time I get there, and it, God has spoke something to me. He showed me a picture. He's given me a, something in my heart. There's a feeling. And then I'm going to, because I, again, I hate the thus saith the Lord stuff. Even though I know it's God, I am not going to put them in a corner to be defensive because I don't know where they're at, who they are, or how they feel about God. So I'm going to ask them a question. So I'm a young Christian, or I'm a Christian, and, and I, I'm supposed to be like Jesus and hear what people really need or where they're really at. And Can I ask you a question? 
And then when the only ones that refuse me are Christians. I'm serious. <laughs> I've never had anybody in the world refuse me, but I've had Christians tell me, no, you're not speaking to me. That's just sick. But the reality is, is then I'm, I will ask them a question. Is, Did you really not get to cry over your mom's death? You know, whatever it is that comes to my heart, I'm going to put it in the form of a question, and then I'm going to watch them. They may go, nope, that's not God. That's done true. Just by the attitude they speak in, I'm going, okay, they're really embarrassed by this fact that, it's, that it is true. So I never judge. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't try and prove I'm right all the time or wrong. But I've learned to trust, and probably... 85% of the time, I find out that it's God. 87? 87. 87. <laughs> she keeps better track than I do, you know. 0.3, too, you know, 87.3. But it's a, you have to practice his presence. You have to figure out a way to recognize that you are hearing from God all the time. It's just a matter of, do you really know who you are? Your identity, does it really, is it really right? Is your perspective of who you are and what, it, what you're seeing correct? Well, if you're distrusting that voice that's inside you, you probably need to get a checkup because that's where he's going to talk most of the time. If you hear his audible voice, it's going to be a real, real, real rare thing. Really rare. Because that's the position we have is to be like Jesus. And if we're going to walk there, this is what has to happen. We have to become aware of how much we're hearing. So do we have another guinea pig or, a, a, sorry, another person that wants to sit in the chair? Okay. She was quicker than you were. So you get to come up and pray then too. The guy sitting next to you, you want to come up? Okay, now you saw what the first crew went through, so you're not going to be embarrassed when I embarrass you, right? Okay. First thought, first word. You're going to ask him and then just trust. Why wouldn't it be God? Who did you ask? Right? Okay. Put your hand on the reason I have people lay hands on people is because God's big into laying hands on people. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I've, I've heard it's scriptural. But we'll try it. Okay. Go ahead. What I don't. What What did you see? <laughs> What did you see in your head, or what did you hear or feel? Nothing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, there was, but we'll go ahead. Well, yeah. Lord, I thank you that. Put your hand back on her. That you show me and the turtles. Okay, so how would you pray that without, you, you don't have to thank God for it. Um, how would you just speak this to a stranger in, in a prayer type wording? No, 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 you don't have to tell him anything except just what you just what you hear. So, Father, I thank you that when I see this lady, I see this turtle. Lord, I thank you that when I see this beautiful woman, I see sunshine. Mean anything to you? Not as anything that has happened, but you know, I feel that like the Lord is giving me a word about her. Oh, yeah? Um, that there is... As I see the turtle, there's a hard shell because there was protection needed. And there's a head coming forth from the turtle. And I'm learning things that I am not used to. Wow. And I know I can trust. I don't have to go back into the shell. Huh. Yeah. So you really did I'm understand not it. i that's cool. But I'm not by tonight. I am. So, uh, <laughs> by position, I wasn't. But I want to say this for the last for the last 
uh, nine months, the Lord has been teaching me, and my friend, that he's giving me the strength to my side, but without saying what was all before that year, but he has, it's like I have a brand new Bible. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. So you got one cornered turtle, <laughs> and it and it's a, it and she gets a prophetic, prophetic utterance for herself from it. Yeah. One word. It makes sense right away. Yeah, I could see right it. away. And, and I saw the picture. I saw the turtle, and the head came forth, and I wow. knew immediately what it meant. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Okay. I'm ready. You're ready. ready. Okay. <laughs> Get your hand back on her. Right. Lord, I thank you that when I see my sister, that I see a white door closed at the moment with light coming around it. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. And? That means that what I'm anticipating and know to be true that has not manifested as a reality in my life is coming. So again, God gives us something that people understand. Not it's not for us. So go ahead. Um, Lord, thank you for allowing me to uh, take 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 a wooden shutter from an old house that is painted pink. It's amazing. Uh, it's like an old house, like the 1950s or 60s. Okay. Cool. And what was the beginning of that shutter? Shutter. Shutter. Wood, wooden shutters. You know, like the wooden old shutters. kind of thing they put on houses that was amazing. Pink. Pink, yeah. I saw a picture of it. Cool. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be God? It is. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, okay, you guys can sit down and she can tell you the rest of it. Yeah. I don't know right now. You don't know yet. Yeah. I have a feeling you'll find out it goes through right exactly with the other two words. Maybe I'll have a dream tonight about Amen. The yes, Big maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. The only way you're really going to get this, because we can't keep doing it because of the amount of people and the amount of time we have, but you need to practice. People are afraid to practice. They're afraid they're going to speak something bad. They're going to dishonor God. They're going to dishonor the person. They're going to get it wrong. I can guarantee you you're going to get it wrong. I've had my face slapped. I've had guys get in my face and tell me to actually bad words, ends with an off. <laughs> so the, the reality is, is you are going to be rejected. It doesn't mean you're not hearing. Mm -hmm. But when we grow into speaking as babies, we learn one word. Then we add another word to it. And in this sense of intimacy with Christ, it's the same way. You have to step out. You're going to be rejected. You're going to be told you're wrong. You're going to be told that God doesn't do that. You embarrass me in front of people. Oh, really? Wow. He, yeah, he's done worse than that, I think, from what I read in the Bible. So. so stop expecting it to be perfect. Stop expecting it to be nice. It's not going to be mean, but it's not nice necessarily either. What did Dana say? Speaking truly, living truly, wrapped in love. That's what your word's going to be. Because when somebody's been in sin for 10 years, the most edifying word you can do is walk up to him and say, have you thought about forgiving your gra grandmother or whatever? That's the most edifying word that you can give them. Not, it's going to be great. This is what God's future is for you. No, he needs to be changed so he can walk over and hug daddy again. Amen? Amen? Get away from religious recitation. It's not that God doesn't use scriptures. Sometimes I answer with a scripture, but it is always short. God's answers are always short. All through the scripture, he speaks to people in plain words that are very, very meaningful, each one of them. Even the Pharisees. Even the Pharisees. He was pretty, pretty, pretty short words with them. Amen? Amen? Okay. So, any questions or any thoughts at this moment? And then we're going to probably stop. Yes? I have a question. Here. It's also giving me some 
confessions and words and all that. But I, I picked up my Bible this morning because I got to teach a Bible class, and I was reading uh, the first chapter of Galatians. A little louder. I was reading the first chapter of Galatians, and I just focused on what the what the word said. And just I don't, I don't know where this in my head. I heard very clearly, "Call on him." So I had a friend in Alaska, so I called him. Hey, Paul, do you know anything about these, these flash drives? I got all these flash drives. I want to figure out what's on them. And it's like, a, so I talk him all through it. And what version of Windows you got? Well, it, it was 10, but the guy downgraded to 8. So, so, okay, I don't know about that. But anyway, within five minutes, he was able to get in there and figure all that out. And then we had about a 45 minute chat. So, um, that was just kind of. Why wouldn't that be God? I'm thinking that. I believe that it was God. Oh, it was. hallelujah. It didn't have anything to do with salvation. It had to be doing with helping somebody and showing love to somebody. Yeah. But mm-hmm. What greater thing could you do? Mm-hmm. So I don't know how many times I've had that happen where I call somebody and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get to give them some great word for God or something or it's going to be a really heavy conversation and it's just encouragement. Mm-hmm. Just like Jesus with the fishing boat. He knew they'd been out all night and hadn't caught anything. What did he do? Oh, you guys should have asked me. <laughs> no, he did not correct them. He just helped them catch some fish to, to support their families. They didn't have any other way to make money. They are broke, remember, and Jesus left. There's no more coffers with money coming in. So he just helped them with their living. So why wouldn't he help your friend? Just your voice and you calling. Hearing God's voice like we, we hear voices. Yeah. That was a that was a very clear voice. Yeah. And and where did it come from? Did it come from outside or where did it come? From in here. Oh, huh. Wow. Imagine that. <laughs> this is just a preliminary, this is just a focus. If anybody wants us to come to their house and walk through this with a small group and spend a day doing it, we are more than willing. Our idea is we're looking to raise the body up to walk in a way that will glorify God and and, uh, actually honor the price that Jesus paid for us. He wants us to walk like him. He wants us to look like him. Not just a few. You have it. Every, Every person in here hears God's voice. It's a matter of finding peace with what you're hearing and trusting that it's important. You never know. Today might be the last day you get to speak to somebody. So ask them a question. Does this mean anything to you? Oh, geez, I've had so many different experiences. (laughs) Oh, with that, Father, I thank you for this group, and I thank you, Father, that my words are going to fall to the ground, and Dana's words are going to fall to the ground, and only your words are going to remain. I praise you, Father God, that you're going to move these people into a great army, Lord. You're going to cause them to mess with all of Post Falls and this whole area, wherever they live, is going to be changed because they hear your voice, they trust you, and know that you are trusting them to change someone's life. Bless them, Lord. Bless them abundantly. Anoint their future. Grant them the provision and the time to be all that you need him to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed.